Well, hello. Uh, thanks for having me here this morning. Uh, it's, it's my delight and joy to be joining you in worship this morning. Um, as I was explaining in the first worship, uh, to be honest, my claim to fame is that I'm, I'm a friend of Jeremy. And, uh, and so he knows everyone in Escondido, and I've had the privilege of uh, being with his family and being with him for the last, oh, uh, maybe two decades or so. Our kids are the same age. And so we're really grateful for his ministry here. I also want to bring greetings and thanks from Westminster Seminary, California, where I work. Um, we've used this facility as our commencement location for many years. And so we're, we're grateful to be uh, partnering with and working with churches who believe in the authority of the word and who desire to lift up the name of Jesus Christ on high here in, in, in these changing and, and sometimes challenging times to be to be working together and like-minded folks is a huge delight and, and, and a, a blessing to us. So thank you. So let's this morning turn to the Lord and ask for his blessing and his wisdom as we open up his word. Father, we ask that uh, as you invite your sons and daughters into uh, your home, that you open our eyes to see your presence among us, ears, O oh Lord, that we may hear your voice, proclaim your word through the scriptures you have given to us. And that these things will not just become simply intellectual exercises for us, but these things will be applied to our lives as we desire to live faithfully for you. We pray these things in the matchless name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Would you turn with me to Philippians chapter 2? We're going to be reading verses 1 through 11. As I understand, this is the series you're going through. This was the passage assigned to me. And we get to read verses 1 through 11 and hear God proclaim his word to us through them. So hear now the word of the Lord. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. So far the reading of his word. What a beautiful text that we have this morning. Paul, when he teaches oftentimes teaches theology that sings. Uh, it seems that EFCC is a church that loves singing and hymns and songs, and we come to recognize that Paul sometimes reminds us of how important it is for us to worship the Lord. For Paul, our theology, that is our belief about God, and our doxology, which is a simple way of saying our worship of God, cannot be separated. They're together. We cannot have worship without the proper knowledge of God, therefore the necessity of theology. We cannot have teachings of theology if it does not lead to us prostrating ourselves before the Lord. That doxology and theology go hand in hand, and then theology and doxology are taken together. At least at nine points in his 13 letters, sometimes he gets into the flow of his theological teaching, and he's moved. And as he's moved, he pauses to lift up doxological praise before the Lord. Sometimes it's more complicated, as you hear in places like Romans chapter 11, where he talked about the mystery of the providence of God, which is a fancy way to say God oversees all things in life. And he says, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. 
he declares, in the midst of his theological teaching. We see this in Philippians chapter 4 as well. In verse 20, he goes on to argue as he's finishing up his book, and as he's talking about the, what, what the Lord Jesus Christ has done, he simply pauses to lift up praise when he says, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. The doxological praise of Paul is seen in different ways in different directions. Other times, Paul may actually include a song, a hymn, a hymn that talks about who Christ is and what God has done. And in our passage this morning, this is exactly what we see in verses 6 through 11. It's both rich in theological content and beautiful in its composition. And the question for us this morning is, what does this Christ hymn teach us? What does this Christ hymn teach us this morning? In short, I want to summarize it by saying, Christ's selfless love toward us on the cross leads to our self-forgetful life in the church. Christ's selfless love toward us on the cross leads to our self-forgetful life in the church in three parts, going in certain order of selfless Christ, selfish church, and then self-forgetful Christian. Um, you, you bring a Presbyterian in, we're going to alliterate everything here. <laughs> Selfless Christ, selfish church, and self-forgetful Christian. And we begin by looking in verses 6 through 11, where the Christ hymn is recorded for us. This beautiful song is in three verses, three stanzas. And the first stanza reminds us, our God came. In this, the emphasis and the highlight is on the word God came. Our God came to us, Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped for success. The mystery and the beauty of the incarnation, ordinarily remembered and celebrated during the time of Christmas, is the very fact that our God came to be with us. Christ Jesus is the God who by his words created heavens and the earth and by his words reversed the curse by calming the sea and healing the blind and the lame. And by his words, as we see in the narrative of Lazarus, gave life to those who had no breath or life. This powerful, omnipotent, all-knowing, wise God came to be with us. As our old creeds declare in the Nicene Creed, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, this God did not consider equality with God a re reason for disengagement or distance, but he descended to dwell among his people in this very messy and at times miserable sin-filled world. This is why John 1 declares, and the word became flesh and dwelt. And that word dwelt in the original means something to the effect of he tented among us and tabernacled with us. But the song goes on to explain this Christ Jesus, who is God who came, emphasizes now that God came. God came. Verses 7 and 8, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This God became a human being. And from being in the form of God, as we saw in verse 6, Christ Jesus voluntarily and out of love took on the form of a servant, verse 7 says. Christ made himself nothing, powerless, status-free, you know where he was born and where he was kept, and impotent in the eyes of the world as a carpenter by assuming the form of a servant. He humbled himself in this way, not by abandoning his power and wisdom as God, but by adding to his divine nature a complete human nature. And this is the mystery of who Christ Jesus is. And even more, this God who became human humbled himself, according to Paul, by being obedient to death, even death on a cross. As Isaiah declared, a song that we often sing using these words in the hallelujah chorus, upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes, we are healed. But not only that he died, but that he died the death of a criminal. The cross, which decorates our buildings now, and oftentimes we wear as jewelry on our necks, was not something that polite people discussed in the first century. In the time of Paul, it symbolized criminality. 
It was reserved for slaves and criminals alone. That cross was so frightful. This is not something that anyone would discuss. Yet, God who came in the form of a human being suffered the death of a criminal upon the cross for you and me. God came and he came to be with us and for us. But death could not contain him very long, as the third stanza in verses 9 through 11, and therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Christ Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The death could not contain him. That as promised in the Old Testament, Jesus rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God. And now there he reigns. He reigns over his people as King Jesus, as we declared earlier. And we will return one day to the praise and celebration of the global, universal, worldwide church in a small microcosmic way represented here. We come to recognize that our Lord reigns even now. When you look at the book of Revelation, I'm sure that you and I might have some differences in understanding the book of Revelation, but you come to recognize the theme. And the theme is simply this, Jesus wins. Jesus wins. Every knee shall bow, every tongue confess. And when our young brothers and sisters go forth to the nations to lift up the name of Jesus Christ on high, It's not your wisdom or eloquence that would do it. It's Christ Jesus who goes before you, who promises to go with you, is the promise that we hold on dear. Because one day, every nation, we are told, will declare his name on high. This is the great parabola of Christ's life. He humiliated, as the theological term works, coming down from his kingship to the servanthood, even to the point of death, and now the reverse parabola of him rising from the dead and ultimately in his glory being exalted. That is the mystery of that parabola of Christ Jesus, where we see the humiliation of Christ and the ultimate glory and exaltation of Christ Jesus. For us is the point. For us. As Romans 5, 8 declares to us, God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We weren't clamoring for a savior. We weren't holding on dear to God. We were actually running away in rebellion and in sin. Um, I have two children. Uh, Anna and Simeon are their names, same ages as Jeremy's kids. And, 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 And we love our kids, bright kids, good kids overall. Uh, We named them Anna and Simeon. Uh, I mean, I I wasn't trying to be funny about it, but it's true, right? They're not perfect. Anna and Simeon were chosen as their names, taken from Luke chapter 2 in particular, because as Jesus, the baby, was being presented, only two people recognized him as the Savior of the world, Anna and Simeon. And our humble prayer as parents is that one day, even if the world denies Jesus, that they will be witnesses of who Jesus is. But as I was saying, they're not perfect. Let me give you one example of it. When, 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 when my son was about three and a half, he started playing soccer, arena soccer. And he was a pretty good athlete. And so in one of the matches, he actually scored multiple goals. I think three was the exact number. And I think he was very proud because uh, he came off the pitch. And then first thing he said to me was, Daddy, Daddy, is, uh, was his voice at that point. I awesome is what he told me. Uh, now, in my mind, I was thinking, humility is good. And... <laughs> And the other part is, complete sentences, also good, is what I was hoping for. But he said, Daddy, I awesome. And then he wasn't done. He went on to say, Daddy, those guys, no good. (laughs) Our children remind us of what it looks like when we live on this side of glory. Cute for a -a three-and-a-half-year-old, not so cute for older people like you and me. (laughs) But the attitude is the same in many ways that we as people oftentimes think think we're good enough, that we forget the kind of sinfulness in which we live. But scripture is clear, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And this is where Christ coming to us is so significant, where Galatians 3 declares to us, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. 
2 Corinthians has a beautiful imagery of this in chapter 8, verse 9, where he declares to us, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty you might become rich. This is the great exchange that takes place. Our Jesus, who is God, came to be poor, dying a criminal's death, so that we who are in poverty because of sin may be raised and exalted because of Christ Jesus our Lord. That is the gospel that you and I proclaim. Our lives are now united to him in such a way that we belong to him. We're identified by him. We're identified with him. This is why a catechism from five centuries ago for some of the churches asked the question, what is your chief comfort in life? And it simply answers by saying that I am not my own. I am not my own, but belong body and soul and life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. I am not my own, but belong body and soul and in life and in death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. I lead a small institution in town called Westminster Seminary, California. It's been about seven years that I've been in, uh, in the lead position, though 19 years is where I worked there, uh, teaching there previously. And what's al al almost always amazing is, like church, there are always challenges. But one of the greatest challenges is how I see myself, where I often identify myself with what I do. I was told at some point in leadership discussions that leadership is about the art of disappointing people at a rate that they can stand. Uh, and I think that's exactly right, because I've disappointed a lot of people. Pastors laugh the loudest here because they know what that feels like overall. We find ourselves misidentified. And what Scripture is reminding us, this Christ Jesus who is sung and proclaimed, it's to him you belong. You are identified with him. And because we are united to Christ Jesus, we can expect for the future hopefulness as chapter 3 of Philippians discusses in verse 20, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lonely bodies to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself, we're told. So what does the song declare? It declares that our King Jesus came to us as man, died a selfless death out of love for us so that you and I might live and belong to him. It's declared to us with clarity. But this is where the question turns and asks, why the hymn here? Why the song now at this particular point in the book of Philippians? These beautiful words of the song probably occupy more theological writing time than the other 97 verses in the book of Philippians. And rightly so. It's not only beautiful, it's content rich. But I want to tell you this morning, Paul doesn't write as a theologian or a philosopher ruminating about the two natures of Jesus Christ. He's writing to us as a pastor, a pastor who's concerned about his church, a pastor who's reminding us something that you and I need to know. And as he writes, Paul is sitting in prison for the sake of the gospel, and he's aware of many who proclaim Christ out of envy and rivalry, sometimes undermining the ministry of, uh, of Paul. Paul says something that I would not be able to say if I were to find out that others were talking behind my back, where he simply says, as long as they proclaim Jesus, it's okay, chapter 1 said. Paul is encouraging them not to be frightened by the opponents, whoever these opponents are, and be ready to suffer, not one of our favorite words by any means, of the inevitable conflict mentioned in verse 29 of chapter 1 in and around the church. Paul repeatedly spoke of unity because there are divisions both outside the church and inside the church. And we see that in chapter 4, verse 2, I entreat Euodia and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord because there's division. And we see this in the beginning of chapter 2, verse 2, being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. Do you get the repetition here? He's reminding us that this is an important part of the church, but sometimes the church struggles with it. And this is where the hymn plays such an important role. In order for unity as well as perseverance, you need to see and look upon Jesus. When you see and look upon Jesus, he says in verse 5, 
have this mind among yourself. For Christ Jesus, for our sake, lived a selflessly loving life. And you and I, recognizing who Jesus is and what she has done, ought to do the same. But here, Jesus is not simply saying, this is him, do this. Imitating him is certainly what scripture desires and and asks us to do. And a number of translations focus on the notion of imitating him. We understand that. Places like the NIV says, in your relationship with one another, have the mindset as Christ Jesus. Just as Christ Jesus had this mindset of a selfless love, you should have this mindset. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. And certainly, it's encouraged that we become more like Christ Jesus as we mature. But the translation that we read today, which is the English Standard Version, I think gets the original a little bit closer, where it accurately conveys Paul's thoughts this way. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Have this mind among yourselves, which is already yours in Christ Jesus. Paul is teaching us a bit of gospel logic about our actions and doing and our ethics. That is, who you are determines what you do. The role is not reversed. When you understand who you are and to whom you belong, it allows us to learn how we ought to act. Being united to Christ Jesus means that he, by his spirit, is slowly but surely surely making you more like him. As Galatians chapter 2 declares, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. No longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This Christ Jesus who did this for us allows us, empowers us, enables us by his spirit to live the same life. For Paul, this life in Christ is not just a set of goals, but our present possession. As we are told in Philippians chapter 1, I am sure of this. I am sure of this, verse 6 says, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. He who began a good work within you will bring it to completion. It's not a way of saying, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. It's about turning to the Lord and saying, Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And in faith, we turn to you as 2 Chronicles 20 declares. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. And you, by your spirit, empowers us by his resurrection power to carry forth with life that he desires from us. Then what is this life? What is this life here he desires? Now, there are a number of things that we can say here, but I want to focus one in particular. If Christ Jesus selflessly humbled himself for us, we also ought to live in self-forgetful humility. Self-forgetful humility. Philippians 2 in the first part declares to us all the needs that we have, desire for unity, as verse 2 says, being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, the necessity of humility in verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves, leading to self-forgetfulness, as verse 4 declares to us, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others, he says. To all of us and to most people in the first century as well who are trained in the art of success, strength, and influence and power, Paul says, be humble. Be self-forgetful. What the Bible says about how we should live as Christians seem contrary to what the world declares. But what the Bible says is simply by losing, you win. Ironically enough. By giving, you receive. By humbling, you are exalted. By being nothing, you become something. By dying, you live. This is the logic of the gospel, contrary to the logic of the world around us. And he says, instead of selfish ambition, we should be self-forgetfully humble. 
Ambition gets a bad reputation uh, by our community, but the word itself is morally neutral. Paul himself was ambitious, as Romans 15 declares, thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, Paul says. But notice how the word is modified. It's selfish ambition. Selfish ambition. What Paul warns against is deep-seated desire for personal gain that leads to competitiveness and arises out of pride and self-centeredness where we play the main person's role instead of the people that God has placed in our lives. Instead of the heavenly mindset that is characterized by humility, that is heavenly mindset referring to the fact that here in chapter 3 we're told we belong to the kingdom of heaven. We're heavenly citizens. And we also come to recognize, as you saw in the previous paragraph, that we we ought to live a life worthy of the Lord. As we think about what it means to live a life worthy of the Lord, belonging to this kingdom into which Christ has brought us, we ought to have heavenly mindset as Christ did. And the original word literally means lowly mindset. But friends, this has nothing to do with inferiority complex, but readiness to forget about ourselves on behalf of others. Readiness to not pay attention to who we are and our priorities and being able to place the priorities of others first as Christ had selflessly loved us, even to the point of death. I was sitting in Pastor Paul's office as, uh, before worship, and there's this magazine, there's C Team at Christianity Today, and the cover was about Tim Keller, a pastor who's now with the Lord, who served in New York. He, had, he wrote a little booklet called The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness, and he has an interesting and I think very provocative and helpful perspective in what it means to be self-forgetful. C.S. Lewis, in Mere Christianity, makes a brilliant observation about gospel gospel humility at the very end of his chapter on pride. If we were to meet a truly humble person, Lewis says, we would never come away from meeting them thinking they were humble. They would not be always telling us that they were a nobody because a person who keeps saying they are a nobody is actually a self-possessed person because even if you're, you're saying less things about yourself, you're focused on yourself is the point being made. The thing we would remember from meeting a truly gospel humble person is how much they seem to be totally interested in us. Because the essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself. It is thinking of myself less. May I say that again? Because the essence of gospel humility is not thinking more of myself or thinking less of myself, it is thinking of myself less. That we forget about who we are before the very presence of Christ Jesus. Self-forgetful humility is the very character that characterizes someone who belonged to heaven. These, this is contrary to our present day on this side of glory. I, I immigrated to the States when I was 10. That's many years ago. In fact, over 40 years ago. And we moved to L.A., and that's where we lived, either in L.A. or in uh, Orange County or Northern California in particular. Now, one of the things as an immigrant, and I'm sure there are many immigrants here or who at least learn the language as a second language, one of the things that you want to get to is to be at a point where you don't have an accent. Accent was the shameful thing you don't want. Um, in Korean, you don't have hard aspirated sounds like uh, V, right, or Zs. And so words like pleasure, pleasure was not easy. Or for that matter, words like Jesus, where it's an S, but you pronounce it like a Z. And so you practice this over and over again, hundreds of times over, before you get to a place where you can get it. Because the hope was that you become accent-free. But as I age, I've come to realize that everyone has an accent, Even in this country, if you're a Bostonian, you have a distinct accent. If you're from Texas, you have an accent. If you're from Minnesota, you have an accent. And even broader, if you go to the global community, you realize lots of people speak English, right? South Africa, the UK, and so on. But all their English is slightly different. I remember one conference that I was at where the speaker was a Brit, and the American scholar got up and began by saying, I really do love your accent, and asked the question, And then the scholar responded by saying, I want to point out, I'm not the one with an accent. You have the accent, (laughs) right? 
But you know how that works here in terms of what country you belong to and the accent that you have. May I propose to you this morning that self-forgetful humility is a kingdom accent. Accent tells us where we're from and where we belong. And self-forgetful humility, which is so contrary to our present-day priorities and desires and attitudes, it belongs to another place altogether. It reminds us that we belong to Christ Jesus. It reminds us that we follow Christ Jesus not only in terms of who he is, but how he was. That we belong to a kingdom that Christ Jesus brought us into. And that we are people of Christ Jesus who live under his reign. That no matter what the world might say about us as EFCC or as Christians or individuals, we belong to Christ Jesus and that's the only thing that matters. And if, even if the world has different priorities, our priority is to follow and be like Jesus. We want to be self-forgetfully humble because this world for the sake of the church's unity and the declaration of God's grace, right? Here, the Lord is empowering and enabling us by his spirit to be like Christ Jesus and to be wherever we may be. Heavenly accents is what we desire, and self-forgetful humility is a display of heavenly priorities in our lives. So, dear friends, as we think about how the Lord teaches us about Christ Jesus in his song, as we think about how not only displays for us an example, but the empowerment of that by his resurrection power, and as we recall what it means to be humble and self-forgetful in our service to one another, may the mindset of Christ Jesus grip you here at EFCC in such a way that the Spirit encourages and empower us to live our lives with selfless love toward one another, and self-forgetful humility toward one another and toward the, toward the world. We pray all these things in Christ's name, right? Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who came, died, and died a criminal's death so that we might have life. But thank you, O Lord, that Christ Jesus is exalted and that one day we will see him face to face without a veil. Until that day, won't you by your spirit work in us and among us, O Lord. Strengthen us daily to remember who Christ is. And may we turn to your word and find in it the beauty of not only Christ's life lived, but his power displayed to us. By your spirit, O Lord, work in us that EFCC may lift up the name of Christ Jesus on high through its proclamation and through its life in the individual members that are here. O Lord, that you may receive all the glory through the church. For we pray these things in the powerful name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.